On May 11th in 2003, 15 year old Sakia Dunn and a group of her friends, they were all female, were on their way home from Greenwich Village in Manhattan. They made a stop on Broad and Market Street, which isn't too far from where we're situated right now, to wait for the number one bus. And while there, two men approached them. And the men who began to proposition them, and like most teens, you can imagine, they were in a moment and they were probably fearful. The young girls rejected their advances. The men, however, were angry after the young women identified themselves boldly as lesbians. Before too long, the men attacked the young girls and Sakia fought back. Sakia, who I'm imagining thought she was gonna make it home that night. Sakia, whose family I'm imagining thought she was gonna make it home that night, did not make it home from that intersection not too far from where we're sitting. Three things killed her that day. A knife in the hands of an adult male, misogyny, and homophobia. We lost a young child, a daughter of Newark, at an intersection. And unfortunately, young people like Sakia and her friends who are bold enough to publicly name themselves as lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, individuals in a society that is still coming to terms with its own homophobia, endure so many types of oppressions every single day. And imagine what life must be like for that young person who not only has to fight homophobia because of a perceived or actual sexual identity, but because of things like race, have to also endure the stings of racism, or because of things like economic disparity, must also fight classism, or like Sakia and her female friends, undergo sexism. And when those things begin to come together, they interconnect, it forms a very precarious intersection for our young people to live through. This is really what called me to do the work um, that I'm doing now. I, along with my business partner, Wade Davis, who is a former NFL player, decided that we wanted to be proactive. And we started a company called You Belong. And one of our first initiatives was to begin a sports camp for LGBTQ youth. The name, as you can imagine, You Belong, is meant to, to let young people know who typically are invisible in our communities. We think they are anyway. We wanted them to know not only do they belong central to our conversations, not only do they belong to, in our neighborhoods and, and, and deserve safety and our respect, but they deserve our love and care. Part of what I want to do really quick is share three things I learned along the way in my work with LGBTQ young people. The first thing that LGBTQ youth need from us is for us to show up. And not just show up as passive uh, observers in a room, but to show up and actually do something when we get there to be active presence in the life of a young LGBTQ person. I can remember, and let me ask, even before I tell you my story, how many of you can recall a moment when you may have been going through something as a teen, 12, 15, 19, you may have had more questions and answers, life might have been very dark for you, somebody might have picked on you because of body size, because of your skin color, because of your sex, because of your lack of clothes or, or not, and a, and a caring adult showed up in your life. Have any of you ever had a caring adult show up exactly when you needed them to? Raise your hand. You also know that when caring adults show up, that might be the very bridge to your survival. So what I've learned is to show up, to be an active presence, not just a presence that's taken up space, but to actually do something. Ms. Dunham was the active presence in my life. I grew up in Camden, New Jersey. I was an awkward boy, as you can tell, from my clothes now. I dressed in what they call church clothes, because I thought I was going to be a pastor. And I did things that most of the females like to do, at least according to my neighbors. I played with the girls. I sang in glee club. I loved to dance. I did not play football. I did not play basketball. I could not see any of the balls coming when they were, because I wore big bifocal glasses. 
So life for me was a pretty, it was pretty precarious. I was picked on a lot, actually. But Ms. Dunham came in and was an intervention in my life. In a moment when I would go home, cry, in a moment at 14 when I actually did not want to live. When I actually did not want to live because I had all these questions about my sexual identity. I don't know if she knew any of that, but what she would do, she would take me home to our house, she would sit me at a piano, make me sing songs that I did not know, I know nothing about classical music, feed me, take me to church, and her presence was an active light in a moment in my life where darkness was very pronounced. You can show up and be an active presence in the life of an LGBTQ young person as well. But when you show up, you also need to show up with empathy. Not sympathy. We don't, LGBTQ young people don't need our pity. As my friend Lillian Rivera says, it isn't because of who they are that, makes them that, ma that, that causes us to want to do something for them. It's not their identity that results in a, and, and, and makes us need, gives us a need to, new, to, to move in a community and act on their behalf. No, actually, it, it, it's the very societal forces that make life for them difficult to move through. Homophobia is a difficult force to move through. And some of our young people who are also of color, who also have to combat racism and so much else, they have a lot of support from us. They need support from us. And I can recall a story of one of my own mentees who, you know, I do this work often and I think I come to the work and I know all that I need to know about the lives of these young people. And this young man, his name is Kamar, he traveled from another country came here on asylum because of homophobia where he grew up, traveled here on his own as a teen, y'all, and got here and was facing the possibility of homelessness, poverty, and so much else. And today that young brother is about to graduate with a master's in philosophy. I thought I knew all that I needed to know. But I learned that empathy requires us to empty ourselves, to remove ourselves, to, to position ourselves in the life of another or in their own shoes. Make, put, our lives in, put ourselves in the shoes of another or ride in a wheelchair of somebody else. And many of us have to practice doing that. Lastly, LGBTQ youth need us to radically love them. Now if I ask all of you right now, how many of all of you love children? Raise your hand. And I bet you if I went around this country and asked that same question, so many people would raise their hand. And I would say, then why is it that our young people are still dying on the streets? If we love them, why are they still not feeling safe enough to be who they are? Radical love keeps us awake. It makes us so uncomfortable when somebody else is being mistreated that we can't even, our consciousness can't even sit properly. Radical love removes the distance that might situate, that separates us from one another. And the only story I can think about, and I'll close with this, is my mother. And I'm less bold than some of the young people I used to work with. I didn't come out or invite in, is what I like to say, <laughs> until I was 28 years old. And I invited my mom to my job. I was so scared because I thought my family was going to reject me. And I said, Mom, I got something to tell you. And my mom said, what is it? She's like, are you sick? And I'm like, no, what is it? And I said, I have a boyfriend. And my mom looked at me and said, I love you. You are my son. Right after she said, really? I knew that all along. Your sisters knew it too. <laughs> and in that very moment, in a moment where we had such a gaping space between us, it brought us together. And that's what radical love can do. Love costs nothing but the destruction of your own walls the very barriers that separate you from somebody else. Because on the other side of that barrier is a young, black and brown, white, LGBTQ person who is waiting for an adult to grab their hand and pull them out of the depths of despair. Are you going to be that person? And if you can't remember anything I said today, anything, remind yourself when the next time you confront an LGBTQ young person that these are our children too. Thank you.